Welcome to another exciting episode of The Intellect, Youth with a Nation at Heart. My name is Daniel Adaja, and on this episode, we are having a conversation on the effect of COVID-19 in Nigeria. And joining me in this conversation is brand storyteller and managing partner at New Day XP, Olaunwa Ogundeji. Hi, good afternoon. Good to have you. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us today. So we have seen that over time, this particular pandemic has revealed so much about the Nigerian economy and even our government. But there are a few issues we would like to highlight on today's episode. And the very first one would have to do with food security. And it is so important that everybody has food to it. That is like the most important thing to help humans survive. And how much effect do you think that this particular pandemic has had on Nigeria's food security? So prior to the COVID-19, okay. um, the federal government had already put in place the border closure to further limit the goods that have been imported. Basically, you know, we're not a manufacturing country. Having the COVID-19, the whole scare, it has sort of increased the, um, the level of panic buying. Mm. And most of the retailers have sort of um, taken advantage of that. So prices have skyrocketed over 50 70 percent mm. and which is not so good okay. to the average nigerians because mm. their purchasing power their pocket um, power yeah. has is not so strong a lot of people are already losing their jobs okay. or their jobs are even threatened at the mm. moment um also you have um, the farmers in terms of um, the supply chain for this goods okay. coming from different states not every state produces so you have states where um, it can be, and um, because of, um, the, a lot of them rely yeah. on road um, transportation okay. to get the goods from one place to the other to states like Lagos. So um, that has really affected um, the supply because there's a huge demand mm. of goods and unfortunate of foods, and unfortunately okay. that's not the case. But on the flip side, we have um, we would also like to appreciate some form of um, alliance between states like Lagos and Kebi, where they um, came up with the initiative of the Lake Rice. Okay. So those have um, sort of, and now we have state governments and also the federal governments trying to give palliatives because they've realized that um, under the Maslow hierarchy of needs, food is the most basic mm. um, necessity. And if you can't eat, you don't even have a strong immune system okay. to fight um, the whole COVID um, virus. Okay. So um, it's a bittersweet um, tale or experience because there's so much scare of fear of going out you know, to the marketplaces where, who, where level of sanitation mm. is not so good. Yes. And um, yeah, was it um, several, maybe a decade ago, where we now began to realize that, yes, we can have supermarkets, like the sh um, several supermarkets coming up. But that's not our nature. We want to get the real produce. We go to the uh, marketplaces. Okay. So um, it's um, a bit scary or worrisome yes. that um, we haven't done enough in terms of preparing ourselves for such an incident. And um, for unfortunately, as well, our agricultural sector has really suffered because of several factors. One, a lot of banks, they are not um, accessible loans. Okay. To a lot of there a lot of paperwork about oh you know how things will be done, but in actual sense, no action or little action has actually been done. Okay. You know, providing the farmers with um, um, you know machineries that can make sure that. They, um, you know, they can produce much more, okay. and also when they even do yes. produce them, storing these goods, you know, storage system is so so faulty because mm. we don't really have that. So before the goods come from a particular location to another so, one, some of the produce get damaged along the line, and you know, it's we, we rely on um, road transportation and um, for transporting this for the logistics. Okay. Yes. So you realize that with um, the state government coming together to say there's going to be an interstate ban. That's and social distancing as well. That's going to limit how um, some of these goods or foods will go from one location to the other. Yeah, even as much as that, I think one of the things the government, the federal government, and some state government made easy was they allowed the movement of food items from one state to the other. But one thing that kept like surprising everybody was the fact that certain food items, the price were doubled or maybe three times the original price. Could there be any moral justification for the fact that? food items are actually going up even in a time when there is a pandemic no the the only thing here we can see is that we nigerians we can be our own problem okay um we want to make quick money 
So um, the, the ideally, price of oil um, transportation, meaning oil, has really dropped drastically. Should that affect the price of transportation of those goods? Not necessarily, but because of, as I said, panic buying. So that sort of brings um, some form of greediness okay. um, to the retailers. So it would cost them nothing. Already they have the supply or they have them in storage. All they just yeah. do is you know, increase the price. We saw that even with the face mask where something sells at a particular amount. And hand sanitizer. Yeah, <laughs> and in the next week or so, it's 100% the exact mm. amount or the actual amount. And yes. it's really scary. It just um, really tells on how we as Nigerians are not empathetic um, to ourselves. We, okay. The human emotional intelligence is mm. not, it's so, so low it, and it's a bit scary okay. because any little thing, any opportunity to make Thank money, you. we just jump on it and yes. it's, it's, it's worrisome. It's not As a, very, a lot worrisome. This is still the intellect youth with the nation at heart. And the next point we'll talk about now is regards to the lack of proper data. And this has affected the whole lot, even to the issue of the palliative distribution, which was a major concern for a lot of Nigerians. And there were various suggestions on this particular issue of the lack of data and also the distribution of palliative, which are like very major concern. And they are sort of intertwined because you need to know the amount of people you are supposed to distribute to. Let's use Lagos for an example. Lagos is supposed to have a population or has a population of about 20 million or more. And then um, we are doing four, five persons in a household. It means we're looking at four million households and looking at how many palliatives we're actually distributed. And there are other stats with one family having maybe nine children. How then do we, how necessary is it for us now to look at how important this data collection is? Yeah, so um, for proper planning in any developed country, for proper planning, um, I think it's important that one of the things they take into cognizance is that data. They get this data, sort of analyze it, after mining it, they analyze it, and you can do future projections on it or with it, especially with humans. Um, one of the reasons you would see how we failed in terms of data gathering is the um, constant, constant, I have to say that again one more time, constant traffic jam. Mm. in Lagos that we're experiencing. Why? Because in the early 60s or 70s, when this road construction was happening, we didn't take into cognizance that there will be more cars on the road. Mm. There were less cars, more bikes on the road way back then. But now it's, it's, it's changed. And unfortunately, um, the last census we did was 2006. 2006, so, so many, several people have died, several people have um, had children, and even that in the sense was not so accurate in terms of the data okay. they got then. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, it's, it is so scary how we do not really have a way of getting this data. Yes, they tried to do the, um, the um, identity card for okay. us. Some people registered when it started till date. They, hadn't, they haven't yet gotten it okay. several years afterwards. And, um, it's just um, sometimes I feel, I feel one of the things we need to look at is the government has to bring in the private sectors, those okay. who are professionals in data gathering or mm. who already have those data. A lot of us have mobile phones. Okay. In America, they have a social security number. It's tied to everything. You search for that, you can get a data, on, a data hit on several people. Here, not is the case. Yes, they're trying to do that through that means, but a lot of us have mobile phones. Perhaps the government can decide to you know, partner or work with um, you know, the telcos to actually look at it and say, okay, this is a way you can identify one or two people through yeah. that. A lot, most, some of us, not a lot of us, have bank accounts. So we have the BVN, which is also tied to our bank yes. accounts, regardless of how many. So we, it's important that we look at data and realize that data mining and data analytics is really key. Mm. You look at NCDC every day by 10 p.m., several Nigerians are on Twitter mm. trying to get the number of the latest COVID-infected people. Sadly, how many people, we see those statistics, but those are not the real data. Those are not the real statistics. Why? Because in a population of over 200 million people, okay. only 15 or less than 16,000 people have been tested, 200 million to 16,000. And you tell us that, oh, so this is the amount of people who have died from COVID-19, less than 300 or less than 400, let me just use that. Unfortunately, in the real sense of it, 
there's several people who have been infected, several people have died. You have mm -hmm. Bauchi State, who said in the last 14 days, over 150 people have died. You have that um, surge in Kano State. Okay. Several people have died. But, you know, because of lack of data gathering, because of lack of, so without even data, you don't even know how many ventilators you need okay. to prepare for. You don't even know how many um, testing kits that needs to be gotten. Because when you have that, that oh, in a week, we need to test an X amount of people, okay. and these people, but, you know, if the government wants us, well, it's, uh, they've privatized it now, but Nepal officials know at least every household. Yeah, that's disco. So, yeah, the discos, they know oh, the distribution. So could the government also tie into their own data network to see, okay, how many houses, how many homes exist in Lagos State? How many homes exist in Alakbere? What is the estimated number? In case we need to reach out to them, if someone is affected in Ogudu, the GRA, what is the radar? How many people, how many places? Because you, it's not just taking them out and you know, isolating them. No. The data would really show that there's a high level of chance that those who have been around them have also been infected. So how can you quarantine that, not just the house, but even the streets the street. around it so that you, you, know, you curb it? But unfortunately, no. We're not seeing that happen. Mm. And the numbers that they are being projected to us are not the real thing. Okay. And data is not just telling us the numbers. There are several people who are dying. People are actually dying. They have names. It's not just limiting the data to, oh, 100 or 10. And, you know, we are, as humans, when you just hear figures, we are not associated or we are not... Um, we, we, it's different when you hear a name than a number. One person, but when you hear the full person's name, you get to know that, oh, yes, this person is actually... Okay, so now, lack of preparedness is a major concern for Nigeria and maybe Africa at large with the fact that nobody expected that this is what 2020 was going to look like. And it's a major concern for us as young people to understand how it's important to always prepare for times that we do not expect. And even in business, they say the same thing, you know, you make plans for the days that would not be raining. So how has this particular pandemic exposed our lack of preparedness? Wow. Um... You look at our healthcare system, um, it's been, it has really deteriorated okay. from inception till date. Okay. Our lack of preparedness has really shown that our healthcare system cannot handle such an issue. Our hospitals, that's why we even had to um, create a makeshift isolation center and all whatnot, and even get these goods. And it's not, um, you know, we are just, uh, I've come to realize we're, pro we're not a proactive country. Okay. our government, we're not proactive, we're rather reactive. Sure. Yeah, you have countries like Singapore who had learned from past experience with the SARS they had in the early 2000s. They had put certain things in place. And um, right now, they sort of, it sort of helped, well, in the initial phase where they had certain strategies to further curb the spread, the spread of, the of, the, of the virus. Yeah. And you see that in some other countries. But yeah. here, our healthcare system, our hospitals, um, even to the workers themselves, they are not really um, they, they are not really being paid properly, or they are not even being paid well. You have a strike. There are several strikes that have happened. If we look back, uh, medical doctors and medical practitioners and all, and it's it's really sad that um, that in itself mm. has is showing it or is revealing itself. Okay. And it, um, um, in actual sense, no one can actually be prepared for this, no matter what. Because okay. why? Two key things. There's no cure yet and a vaccine. So if those are not in existence, then we're just sort of running blind. Mm. And it is also very scary because um, the numbers will keep increasing um, and um, the hospital beds will be filled up. Okay. And it's um, at the end of it all, clearly we're a reactive government. Mm. What are the next steps that these people, or the, or the okay. government, are actually going yeah. to take? It's really important. So there has to be some, some um, form of um, budget allocation for future um, development and all. It's important that the government needs to be proactive. Okay. They need to see things. So after the post-COVID, they need to re-evaluate a lot of things, making sure that health workers are being paid properly, making sure that there's some form of security measures, and there's a strong reactive... Um, urgency when, so it's just like a fire um, incident happens in a house. What's the estimated time a fire truck would come from its station to, to that particular place? So we need to also look at that statistics to say, okay, if this sort of thing happens again, 
what are the major instances or what are the things we need to put in place? So is, mm. do we need to further equip the hospitals in each local government okay. to be a world standard? Mm. After the whole post-COVID, I was talking to a friend, after the whole post-COVID, what happens to these equipment that have been purchased or donated? Mm. We need to make sure that they do not go to private hospitals, mm. but rather they need to be put back into the government hospitals, the okay. public hospitals. Yes. So those are the things we need to start thinking about, conversations we need to start having. We can, and it, it's important, so it, it's from a down, I mean, top-down um, perspective in terms of pro proactiveness. Okay. Our government needs to be more proactive. They need to be more proactive. Okay. It can never be emphasized enough. All right, thank you. So still moving on with this particular conversation on the intellect today, um, another particular aspect that has largely affected, although you emphasize a lot more on the health sector, is businesses. And this particular COVID-19 pandemic has exposed us to look at to you know to think differently when it comes to businesses and that's why um, the conversation around doing business different is so important right now and if you look at a lot of people are moving uh, for the corporate sector now people that used to be in an office space and now, now have to work from home how important is this uh, particular experience or this evolution with regards to this pandemic which this pandemic has brought important for business people well it's a wake-up call um, I always say there are two sides to a story. Um, there's always opportunity and hardship. So when we look, have the um, flip switch, we realize that right now we are not necessarily in an industrialized, well, it's not an industrial e economy anymore. Okay. It's digitally driven. Hmm. So the, the era of digitization has actually come to stay. We need to do um, business differently. Um, it's a wake up call. Um, but we're now in a digital economy or a digital society. And it is very, very important that um, both business owners and even the government sort of embrace, and even as individuals, you know, we embrace that digital skill acquisition because that's how we can survive in okay. the 21st century. And um, I really believe that this has opened a lot of people's, um, it has opened up a lot of, um, you know, closed conversations yeah. about how to transition from just being traditional to digital. You have several companies now having Zoom call, um, having Zoom meetings, you know, very few um, because of the social distance and all, people are working from home. Could that have happened or could this conversation have happened? Imagine you telling your bank or whatever, um, your employer that don't worry, I can work from home. Uh, they would look at you and in Nigeria, no way, it won't happen. Mm. But guess what? It's happening now. Yeah, yeah are they um, really breaking in the numbers? Not necessarily, but eventually it's getting there. It's revealing that this is a possibility. This can happen. So it is to take that possibility as a reality, which okay. we already are in right now, and further realize that what are the digital skills or what are the assets, digital assets, that we need to harness or we yeah. need to bring in into our company? Okay. Do we need to have a workforce application in place? Do we, where um, workers can clock in and clock out, you know, make um, invoicing and all whatnot? Do we need to have websites? Because people are not really coming to our offices. So have a virtual office. So it's important that um, companies need to do things differently. Uh, you know, there was an instance where I watched a video of a driverless car going to deliver a pizza um, box to a client, to a customer, autonomous. Hmm. But here in Nigeria, you know, with the road and all, so it's, it's, <laughs> he's even putting in place that infrastructure. Yes. We are, there, there's a whole controversy about the whole 5G networks and all whatnot. But yes, we have 4G. What have we even done with it? Okay. Before we're even talking about the 5G. 5G. What are the things, is there an IoT in place where the, the internet of things are happening, where everything is all interconnected to each other? Okay. All these things, is there um, an infrastructure in terms of our technology to further help us get, um, gather data as the government, you know, gather data from the citizens, register them, you know, all these things. So even as business owners in the informal sectors, even if you're in the marketplace, nothing stops you from having your POS. Nothing stops you from having, um, you know, your mobile banking um, app where p transactions can happen. Thank you very much. But just yeah. before we wrap up this conversation, I'd like to know like, what are the specific lessons you have learned so far uh, from this particular COVID-19 pandemic? I've come to realize one, governance is hard, really hard. Um, it's very difficult governing people, especially Nigerians. If I'm to use a very good word for it, we are quite resilient. But in actual sense, it means stubborn. Mm. We're very stubborn. It, we're very heady. I wish we had 
you know, put in place a very a more strict measure during, during the first lockdown, which we've lost um, that first one, four weeks. If the, um, you know, even if the military had come in and made sure that we stayed at home, a, lo a lot of us did not, you know, a lot of us did not abide by those rules and regulations that were put in. And um, it's unfortunate that this is, so it's, governance is really, really difficult. It's not for the faint hearted. Um, number two I've learned is in everything, always try to see, you know, the bright side or the, um, the other side. So there's always going to be two sides to a story. Yes. For others, job loss, but for others as well, you know, there's job employment because they have some skill set. So innovate or die. It's important for you, whatever you do, even as an individual or as a company, you need to be innovative. You need to look at things differently, look at the world differently. And finally, um, it just really shows how much planning ha needs to be done post-COVID-19. And that bulk falls on the government because they need to put in place certain things, especially in the healthcare sector. Not just that, even in the agricultural sector, in diversifying, okay. because the diversification is also part of innovation. Mm. So they also need to look at that, those areas to further make sure that, you know, we are a self-sufficient government. Already as citizens, we're self-sufficient to an extent. We generate our own electricity. Okay. We generate, we, you know, we pump our own water from the ground. We are our own security, we provide our own security to a large extent. So why can't the government also, you know, imbibe some of our own traits and become self-sufficient, mm -hmm. not depend on foreign importation? Thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of The Intellect. And special thanks to our guest, Olaolu Ogundeji, for joining us today. And do not forget, for more information, log on to our website, www.theintellecttv.com.ng. Remember, for more information, you can follow us on all our social media platforms at The Intellect TV Show. Please do not forget to stay safe this time and as much as possible, social distance, use hand sanitizers, wash your hands regularly, and also make sure you're putting on your nose max. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that tour. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Business Crest. My name is God Queen Aniki. As you all know, I'm here to season it all up with um, business advices as well as business gurus that you need to know and learn from. Well, ever heard about someone who is the financier of the revolution? Someone who served as the superintendent of finance of the United States? Someone who played a critical role in winning and securing? Securing America's independence. Someone who traded flour and tobacco to France in exchange for war supplies such as powders, guns, blankets, etc. Well, if you don't know, I need you to go read about Robert Morris. Robert Morris is the first financier of the revolution. Till we meet again, guys, stay safe and please follow all our social media platforms down your screen. Bye.